Hi, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Um, I'm uh, I'm Yang Liu, faculty member at Airman University, a cast member. Um, I'd like to welcome all of you to session 5A, uh, complementing low cost PM monitoring. How can satellite data provide value to community organizations and cities? Um, I have an excellent lineup of four speakers, all accounted for here. Um, all right, without further ado, I have my first speaker, uh, Dr. Jeff Pierce from Colorado State University. Yeah, come around. All right, well, thank you. Thanks for having me speak. I'm so this is a session on how low cost monitors and satellites can work together to better understand particular matter. Um, so I'm gonna speak about some work we're doing in rural regions where there's not a lot of regulatory monitors where we can use low cost monitors to help augment what satellites can see. So we have been working in the smoke space for a while and we've developed a smoke product to try to understand who's being exposed by smoke, when and where. And so what we do is we combine two data sources that are imperfect. They give each provide information, but not enough. And so we bring in satellites that are really great at detecting where the plumes are horizontally. Uh, and most of the time they can't tell you whether it's at the surface. Sometimes there's issues because there's a cloud and you can't see smoke under the cloud. We also use regulatory monitors, and these are great. These tell you exactly what you want to know. They tell you how much particulate matter is, but at that location. And often people live away from monitors. I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, but what we do, what we have done by combining these is try to come up with, oh, yeah, so we need to know where, where, where people are even away from monitors. And so what we try to do is come up with a gridded product of where smoke is and how much smoke is for every day. And we've used this both in epidemiological studies, health impact analyses, and as well as trend studies. So I just want to show one example. So this is led by a former student of mine, Kate O'Dell. And so this is just looking at trends in summertime PM from 2006 to 2020. And this is the overall trend where, because of regulations, the East has gotten much cleaner, but the West has this increasing trend during that time in the summertime. Smoke, oh, what does smoke mean? Oh, so this is the, okay, good, good question. So this is, no, it's okay. It's a good reminder. So this means every year on average, the PM 2.5 concentration has, if you're negative one, has gotten cleaner by one microgram per meter cube each year. So over this 15 year period, that's a decrease of 15 micrograms per meter cube, which is pretty incredible due to regulations. But then in the West, there are these increases by about 15 micrograms per meter cube. So thanks for, if it's negative, it's improving. If it's if it's if it's blue, it's improving. If it's red, it's getting worse. And so what we're able to do with our product where we can separate smoke and non-smoke throughout every day from that period is we can separate this into the non-smoke trend, where when we take the smoke out, even the West is getting cleaner, except for some few areas down here that are probably due to dust trends, where we haven't removed the dust trend. And then the smoke trend is that smoke has gotten worse in the West over that 15 year period. So this is all great and we've done a lot with it, but there's been some things that are unsatisfying about it. And so part of it is that our method relies on surface monitors. And yes, we interpolate between the surface monitors and we have information there, but we don't have much confidence in it. So in these areas, see, is this a laser? In these areas, these gaps between monitors, our confidence in our estimates are lower. And so, what we wanted to know is there's all of this additions of low cost monitoring. And so I'm just gonna show a map here of the existing public purple air monitors that have many, many, many more monitors. There's still some gap areas. There's places where people live or people don't have these purple air monitors yet, but we could at a relatively low cost, add them to regions. Um, can we improve our smoke estimates in some of these hard to find regions? So what we've done is through the HACAS funding, is looked at three target regions where there's interesting smoke things that have happened. And to try to understand between satellites and low cost monitors and whatever existing federal monitors are there, how well can we quantify smoke impacts in these regions? So I just wanna give a little bit of an overview of these three studies that we've done through HCAST. So the first is on the spring prescribed fire burning in the Flint Hills region of Eastern Kansas. 
And so every year, particularly peaking in April, a huge fraction of the land in the Flint Hills region, which is primarily uh, prairie grasslands, is burned each year to decrease the risk of wildfires, maintain the ecosystem by keeping out invasive species, and to improve nutrition for livestock that, that goes on those rangelands and, and feeds off of the grass. And so I just want to show you, um, I'm going to show a movie in a second that shows the smoke on one day. It's going to be an animation. And then here on this side are the regulatory monitors. So this is the Flint Hills region here where there's no regulatory monitors. So you'll just be able to see here what the smoke looks like building up through the day. And you'll see when the sun sets in the video. And look at how thick the smoke gets. This is all from prescribed fire. And yet the monitors aren't there to see it. And so just put the smoke back up near the peak. These are the existing public purple airs that help a little bit. So these are what you could go and get online from Purple Air. What we did through the Haycast Tiger Team funding is we were able to find citizens that were interested in better learning about their smoke, and they were willing to host Purple Airs during the burn season. And so that shows all the monitors that we were able to pull out to cover that region. And so then we use satellites to help augment this and help us tell when smoke is there versus not there. And so Olivia Sablon and, and my group has been doing a lot of this analysis. And on days where there's local smoke, the PM concentrations from the monitors are shown here going up above 12 micrograms per meter cubed. And on the smoke-free days, it's about a third of that. So the smoke contribution on those days is contributing to the majority of smoke on those days. The concentration is more than double the days. So we're able to get this information where there previously, if you just looked at the regulatory monitors, you wouldn't know this because the peak in these concentrations is not where the monitors are. And just to give another plug for satellites, this is the product from Randall Martin's group. Um, and we only just recently got 2022 data um, just because of time it needs to get EPA's uh, monitors into their product. So we'll compare that next. And then this is from Shoba Kondragrucha's group's um, GOES product. So these are both satellite-derived PM products that both show this peak in the springtime PM concentrations, just like our monitor study showed. And so this is just from... Uh, Randall Martin's three three down from you. He just raised his hand. It, 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 he is a faculty member at Washington uh, University in St. Louis. All right. So next is um, study that was talked about yesterday by Cheryl Magsman and Annie over there in the that we piloted in the um, Southern Florida region. And so um, Annie gave the best overview of this. But like in short, the sugarcane companies expedite their harvesting process by burning the plants that is able to allow them to get the sugar cane at a lower cost at the expense of exposing people to smoke. And so this is a map of during our time period where we had monitors out between October and May. This is the area that burned during that time. So it's just a huge fraction of that land within that season burns. It's pretty incredible. Um, and, the, and the fires look like this, you know, in each location, the flaming portion of the fire is pretty quick, but then the smoke can linger for several more hours and, and be produced and smoldering for several more hours. So the monitors are, the federal regulatory monitors are here. This Belglade monitor, I believe, only came online at the end of 2021. And so up until that time, there was no actual regulatory monitor in the heart of the burning region. And so that, that exists now, which is great but we wanted to help supplement it. And so here are the public purple layers that people already had. And then here's who the, the people who were able to, wanted to know more about their air quality and uh, listen to some of our models. And so Olivia's can, like working on this analysis, but what we're showing is on days where HM, the satellite product by NOAA identifies the smoke as of medium thickness. And we have filtered out days where smoke has been transported in. The particulate matter concentrations are about seven micrograms per meter cubed and daily average. So it probably was higher at the worst time of the day, but when we average over the day, it's, eight, it's about eight micrograms per meter, uh, where it's about four micrograms per meter cubed on the smoke free days. So on those days, it's about double and probably higher in the worst hours. And finally, I wanna talk about um, this study. This is Chris Uegio's um, rapid response team in New Mexico. And so there's this region in New Mexico where there's not a lot of regulatory monitors. And in 2022, uh, they had their worst 
wildfire season. And this is just an animation from the GOES satellite where there's both dust coming down from Colorado and in New, New Mexico, as well as these really thick fire plumes going away from where the monitors are. And so Bonnie Ford, who was in my group, uh, was working on this product with us and with Chris to try to come up with what the smoke concentrations were everywhere. And it's tricky because in this case, we did not deploy our own purple airs. So we're only using the public purple airs. And so you can see we're trying to come up with what the smoke concentrations are over here. And there actually aren't any purple airs, public purple airs there either. And so we, because we're doing this retrospectively, we weren't able to put out monitors to help. But it should have shows us we can bring in the purple airs to help some, but ultimately we want to have more low cost monitoring everywhere all the time. And um, that's what I have, so thank you. So on for filtering out the, the transport of smoke, we looked at the size of the HMS plume and we traced it back to wildfires. And if it was one of those days we said it was transported smoke, if there were also clearly hot spots on that day with local plumes, we had another category called transported plus local. But what I was showing here was the, the local just to not have the confounding back group. You want to wait? Next speaker is uh, Sarah. Good morning. Thank you for all. Um, thank you all for coming. My name is Sarah Craning, and I first want to say my background is education. So it has been very helpful to be here learning from all of you who are experts in this field. Um, I'm here on today on behalf of the Children's Health Alliance of Wisconsin. We are a voice for children's health. We are housed within Children's Wisconsin, which is a hospital system located in Milwaukee. Um, and so our organization um, not only has the, um, the support from Children's Wisconsin, but then we have a local advisory board um, that has that's represented by different organizations across our state. We have six different initiatives that work to help children across our state, um, whether that's through policy, different changes um, through local um, programs. And so today I'm here on behalf of the Environmental Health Initiative, which is also we lead the Wisconsin Asthma Coalition. So we took our information, knowing that Milwaukee has one of the highest asthma rates in the state, um, as well as a disproportionate exposure to air pollution, um, to apply for a grant, an EPA grant that we were awarded for three years for $500,000, with a focus to um, provide an air quality monitoring network across the um, city of Milwaukee, because we also recognized that um, the regulatory sensors, there was only three of them, and they um, were not placed in areas that had this higher impact um, with the asthma burden. So we are specifically measuring outdoor PM 2.5, and we are connected with the public school district in Milwaukee. Um, through this process, we learned of Love My Air Denver, which is a program um, that's been in place for a couple of years now, and they are also working with school districts and they have been an amazing partner for us to not only share their resources, um, but also to encouraged us to use their tools and kind of like the, the outline of their program to be implemented in the city of Milwaukee. Um, so we are measuring air quality at schools because first of all, the, the impact that it has with um, of the asthma burden, but then also the environmental equities that, in, um, that exist in the city of Milwaukee, the fact that there were limited regulatory sensors, um, and then also by working with schools, we get to engage with students, their families, community members um, through that educational programming. So a little bit more um, about the poor air quality and the impacts on health when we think about children with asthma. Um, they sometimes, you know, it depends on how often they're exposed to these air quality um, situations, but it has acute and long-term exposure impacts on them that causes, um, you know, engagement at that school, whether it's that they're distracted, they might not be feeling well, they might be going to the nurse's office, they're missing lessons, they might be staying home from school, um, just has this compounding effect on their ability to engage at school and have long lasting impacts on their overall success. Um, and then additionally, for their families, they're taking time off work to care for their children, they're going to um, doctor's appointments. And so not only is that time off work, but then that's a financial burden as well. 
So with our program, we are focused on that central hub of really working with each community of the school itself. So knowing that there's differences between schools. Um, and so La Mayor Denver has this wonderful menu that they've created that um, the school then can pick what makes sense for their student population, their families. Um, so the first area is a foundations program. We are providing an air sensor to each of the schools that are participating. So our first year, we have five schools. Each year, we, add, we are adding on another five schools. So at the end of our three-year grant, we will have 15 schools participating. And um, this is at no cost to the school. Um, we are not asking any of the staff to be helping install this sensor. We are paying for people to help us install the sensors. Um, and then with that, we are providing staff training and then um, a toolkit to, to engage with the community, a nurse school to, toolkit that also will include uh, information about asthma. Um, another level is the educational programming. We have an amazing partnership with Subject to Climate. And um, so we will be creating lesson plans with them. They get posted to their site. Um, something that's really amazing and beautiful about this program is that they um, train teachers. So it's not anybody can come post a lesson. There's a quality that they are expecting the lessons to um, uphold. So then those are get reviewed. And then they also have scientists on their team that review to make sure that the data that's being provided is accurate. Um, and so that will be provided um, as well at no cost or um, obligation from the teachers because this is something that we have a team doing for them. Um, additionally, we have air beams that we're going to be providing to schools to be using as they want to explore what makes sense to their community. There might be a certain um, road nearby that they want to see is there something more happening during high traffic times. So they can pick, they can use those air sensors to do more exploratory community science level um, investigations. And then the next level is the intervention programming um, where they have, um, we're working with another um, partnership, Playworks, who does um, outdoor recess and they are actually within Wisconsin, but across the, the nation as well, um, teaching kids how to be interactive with each other in a very productive manner. They have student leaders. So incorporating this into evaluating, is it safe to play outside today? Do we need to stay inside? And then looking at the impact of activities that they should be doing based on air quality. Um, and then another big piece of this is an anti-idling campaign where we will provide um, some data, some work with them to an analyze data of people that are dropping their children off um, before school, after school, and the idling cars, um, buses included and then um, providing the anti-idling campaign and then doing another observation to see, is there a difference um, after we provide this information? So um, a big focus on providing a menu of what works and what's needed in each school's community. Um, so this is just a little a chart to show all of our amazing partners that are have been huge in making this program possible, but also co continuing to collaborate as we move forward. Um, so some challenges that we've experienced is the staff turnover rate. Um, you know, if we're working with one school and we have an amazing champion and then they either leave the profession or go to a different school, um, then, you know, are working with new people. Um, logistical challenges with equipment, resource overload. As I've been here this weekend, there is so much um, around air quality right now and it's amazing, but making sure that what we're providing to our schools and our families is going to make sense to them and be user-friendly. Um, leveraging data in a user-friendly manner. Um, and then from some future program challenges that we see is um, community engagement, specifically something that we're trying to work through is um, having connection to data on Wi-Fi at home. Um, that's not always um, a stable situation for people. And so we have these sensors, but we wanna make sure that they can truly access them. Um, the durability, we are using purple air and we are hoping that, um, you know, where we're installing them on the outsides of schools, They'll, they'll last for quite a few years, but it's something we're new to this. We're not quite sure. Um, and then ideally we're going to see that this does have an impact for our families and we'll be able to get sustainable um, funding so that this can be grown across our state because we recognize that this is a, a situation across our state, not just in the city of Milwaukee. Um, so then What we're here for with the uses of satellite data, we're looking at this as possibly um, being incorporated into lessons for our students where they get to speak again, use this information as um, a higher level of looking at what is causing their sensors to be reading the information that they are reading. Um, I think some of the information that's been provided today, even with um, 
the animations showing the smoke, um, especially this summer. It, this is a very popular topic right now. And there's a lot of momentum going around this in our area because of the wildfires from Canada. So um, taking a look at that information, um, one of our partners recently shared with me that house fires in the area is a high concern. So even looking at something like that for them to see if that's having an impact. Um, and then our university partners and our partner organizations to have um, be able to use the satellite data to further investigate um, the information that our sensors are reading as well. So um, if anybody's interested in learning more about our program, the QR code takes you to our air quality website, um, Children's Health Alliance of Wisconsin. Um, and my email and number are there. Um, again, this is, we are, I, my background's education. So to learn from all of you, if you have ideas on ways for us to incorporate satellite data, please reach out. We would love to hear from you. Oh, <laughs> thanks. All right. <laughs> Hold on, hold on. Any any quick clarifying questions? Just want the memories to fresh. Okay, good. Class, there. Um, next speaker, Owen. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to switch some gear and uh, I'll talk a little bit more about the data sets which we are creating, and uh, we have data sets for US, uh, but also covering the global uh, global regions. Okay, so I'm going to start with the this reanalysis called MERA2. Uh, it's a long-term reanalysis produced by NASA starting from back in 1980 to current time. Uh, it's a course resolution, half degree resolution, but it provides you uh, different aerosol components. And if you uh, use some equation, then you can actually calculate surface level PM2.5. And this has been done using uh, satellite data assimilation into GEOS model. So it's very consistent in terms of the model uh, and the satellite data state of our data sets. But if you start comparing this with the ground monitors uh, globally, then you will see uh, this kind of results, uh, which is probably not fair to compare at that level because these are 50 kilometer data, you're comparing point measurements. So there are a lot of factors which goes into that. But what we are trying to do is how we can make this uh, better uh, using some of the machine learning techniques. Okay, so the first uh, step or the first case study which we did uh, for this specific analysis is we combined MERA2 data, uh, both aerosol and metrology with the surface PM2.5 data uh, in machine learning and deep learning algorithms to get two different aspects. One is historical PM2.5 data. And then if you replace the MERA2 with the GEOS FP forecast, then we can get also the forecasted PM2.5. So we did a study in Thailand in partnership with NASA survey program and Thai pollution control department. Uh, this data at that time were not available in public domain, but because of this partnership, we were able to work directly with the Thai government and we were able to get access to this data. We used that data, we did some machine learning, we got to this type of results. And eventually, this was actually implemented into a forecasting system uh, for the Mekong region, which includes Thailand and neighboring countries. And this system has been actually adopted by Thai Pollution Control Department in partnership with NASA Survey Program, which is USAID and NASA partnership. So this was a really a successful story that uh, we started with some research and it went actually into a operation uh, by a uh, international um, uh, a country government. Okay, so moving on, uh, we did similar analysis, and I want to highlight that uh, he is uh, Dr. Al Saeed. He worked with Lesare at Mass Marshall. He has done a lot of work, uh, uh, which I'm presenting here. So we did similar analysis for the US. Uh, we published a paper also, and this data actually for US uh, for both hourly and daily levels available, should be available soon uh, at NASA Just Disk. Uh, through an ACAST partnership with Kevin uh, during the last term. Okay, so moving on to the global scale now. So we did these uh, regional studies and that gave us a lot of confidence. So we thought, okay, why don't we do it on a global scale? 
So on a global scale, if you look at the data distribution, you will see there's a lot of gaps, especially in Africa, South America. And these are not all the data. These are the data which are available on open uh, public forum, especially, specifically through the open LQ. So there are a lot of challenge when you go globally from regional to global, uh, aerosol typing are changing, the metrology is different, the topography is different, uh, the seasonal and all kind of different uh, problems which you see, the data gaps. So instead of doing a simple machine learning, we did an ensemble approach where we considered aerosol typing and the seasons and the uh, data volume, data availability, all those factors, and came, came up with an ensemble approach, uh, which worked pretty good actually. Uh, so this was our global result, which we are still uh, in preparation to publish this. But overall, we see, we compare this over 5,000 plus ground monitors, and we were able to get this at hourly scale. If we do this on a daily or monthly scale, uh, this improves significantly. But there are still problems remain. So if you look, this is a bias with respect to the observed PM2.5, up to around 200 micrograms per cubic meter, we are doing pretty good. But for high aerosol events, for high PM2.5 events, we are still significantly underestimating. And that is a data distribution problem. So anytime you use machine learning or any statistical method, uh, we get to this uh, problem, which we have seen all. But nevertheless, uh, we started producing this data uh, from 2000s to current time. Uh, the data set should be available soon with the NASA data centers at just this. There's a poster out. If you have not seen that, they will tell you all about the, how to access this data. This data is also going to be also available in Google Earth Engine. We are partnering with the Google to ingest the data sets so that the, all the Google Earth Engine capabilities can be used uh, to access this data and analyze this data into different ways. Okay, so I want to quickly talk about some of the satellite aspect of uh, upcoming opportunities, which we are already uh, started seeing. So we have talked about this figure a lot. Um, various people have actually shown this. This is a constellation of uh, UV based sensors, which include Tempo, James, and Sentinel 4, which is going to give you hourly measurement, mostly focusing on trash gases. But we often forget about this constellation, which already exists and operational, and which provides you every 10 minute global coverage of aerosols uh, starting from the goes west, goes east. We have recently launched Meteosate third generation, which has a sensor called FCI, which is almost identical to AVI sensors. And then we have Himawari and AMI covering the Asia. So we have almost global coverage every 10 minutes for atmospheric aerosols, which can be used to finally convert it PM2.5. So th there is a really great opportunity here to actually use this data sets. But the challenge is how, how we actually use this data set, uh, combine this coming from the different sensors, there are some differences. Uh, so we did a baby step in that direction, actually implementing goes our PM2.5 data into EPS Air now as part of NASA, uh, this HACOS Tiger Team effort, which we did in previous term, and we are continuing doing uh, in this term with uh, Nyang is leading this time. So we have this partnership between NOAA and NASA. Uh, we have goes east and west. We did a lot of uh, data analysis, validation. NOAA is pro producing the product initially. We are adding value using machine learning, doing bias correcting. And then finally, actually ingesting into air now. So this is almost at the last stage where EPA, uh, we have delivered all the pipelines, but EPA is implementing. So in few months, I'm hoping this will be uh, in public domains. Uh, and I want to again credit to Alkma who did a lot of uh, data analysis, but then Baron and Henderson at EPA who really pushed from EPA side to make it happen. So. Uh, this is a really great uh, story or success story from our previous Tiger team. Okay, so as I was mentioning earlier, there are challenges, right? So uh, we have lots of data from polar orbiting, and now we have these 10 minute geostationary satellite data. So, how do we use them together, right? So, that is going to be a huge channel. So, we, we uh, challenge and we started looking into that. So, this picture just shows an example where we are getting. We need advanced data fusion technique where we can actually bring data 
from multiple source and put them on the same spatial and temporal resolution and make it useful uh, so that people can use uh, all around the world. So what you see here are the three geostationary, uh, those east, west, and Himawari, and then we have three uh, polar orbiting, Modestera, Aqua, and the Beers, and Sunni and PP, and all of them is merged. And the dark area is basically nighttime where we don't have any data. So you have a daytime global coverage of 10 minutes to 30 minutes steps. And that's all I have. Thank you. Again, quick clarifying questions. All right. Thanks a lot, Brian. Brian. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Brian. Thank you about that. Integrating NASA resources in the standard operating procedures of low to moderate LMIC. Okay. Uh, and, and this work is, uh, I'm, is, well, the success of this work is definitely our two stakeholder, uh, our two uh, co eyes here, Anna Prados and Kevin Cromer. You all met Kevin. Uh, Anna couldn't be here. Um, and so, Kevin, you know, is a health professional and he brings a lot of expertise in uh, the, the questions on how um, air pollution and health are related in these uh, cities. Uh, and then, of course, Anna Prados, uh, many of you have met in the past. Uh, she has uh, decades of experience working with stakeholders around the world. Uh, and it also helps us because she's a native Spanish speaker. And so we're able, uh, we made inroads into Latin America. Our project has two parts to it. Um, the first part is working with just a, a small number of stakeholders uh, to get to know them uh, and their individual needs and to identify common needs among these few stakeholders. And then the second part is to identify ways to scale up our activities to reach uh, more stakeholders, uh, many stakeholders in the LMIC. Uh, so for this talk, uh, I'll be focusing on step one. And hopefully at the next hate guest meeting, I'll, uh, we'll be able to talk about step two. And if you're interested in our methodology for scaling up our interactions uh, with many stakeholders, uh, please take a look at our paper that came out. And uh, Find it, just uh, let me know. Just email me. Send it to you. Okay, so this is a very complicated looking graphic, but it describes our project uh, in detail. But essentially, it's it's how how do we take these NASA resources and integrate them into the partner's decision making process uh, for whatever their applications have, whether it's forecasting, mitigation planning, uh, siting of new monitors, and so on. Uh, so. The, the three the, the three main categories of NASA resources that we have are the air quality forecast system, and that's led by Christoph, Christoph Keller. Uh, of course, we have all different types of satellite data sets, uh, and Kevin Cromar and his team is developing health and air quality index, uh, which some of these measures are interested in adopting. Uh, and then I have low-cost sensors there, so NASA really doesn't uh, do much low-cost sensors, but all of these um, air quality uh, Stakeholders are very interested in low cost sensors uh, to, uh, in combination with the satellite data and air quality forecast, create a low cost and effective uh, air quality monitoring system. Fortunately, we have Carl Mollings at NASA, who has talked to a number of our stakeholders about how uh, low cost sensors and satellite data they can be able to uh, bring more information um, outside of the areas monitoring these low cost sensors. Okay, so first, the step one is um, so step one is we're working with these select stakeholders and it's focused on this talk, as I said. So these stakeholders, even though there's only four groups of them, they're very interesting because they have a wide range of expertise in working with satellite data for health and quality applications. Uh, they have a wide range of financial resources and experience, and even experience with health and quality issues. Uh, and they have a wide should be now do a deeper dive in the age part of the So first is the city government of Rio de Janeiro. Uh, we are a champion of the city And the city government of Quito, uh, Bella, uh, very interesting sorry about that there. And they're interesting in that they have a lot of the same needs and uh, capabilities 
uh, though Rio has uh, quite a bit more money, so they have more, they actually have healthy and loving staff, uh, <clears throat> so they're able to build uh, capacity. Whereas the city of Quito has a very limited amount of funding, and very few people, and so they have to be capable of capacity. Uh, but they both uh, interestingly have their own air quality monitoring networks uh, in their cities. And so we had our usual handshake telecons, uh, talking to them about satellite and technology management, uh, giving them ideas about different NASA resources and uh, standard operating procedures. We had a few webinars and thing about this is uh, pretty quickly, uh, both uh, the upper management of both cities said, hey, we really would like to know how uh, the health outcomes in the city correlate or associated with uh, the uh, in situ monitoring in the cities. And at first I was a little put off by that because that's really not the focus of our project. And I thought it saw more as a diversion. But Kevin Cromar and his team, including Laura Glass, who's here at the University of the Yep, she's uh, They said, well, we can do this. We can do this. And so they performed health analyses for both cities with their in situ monitor data and data from emergency room visits. And uh, as you would expect, they found associations between uh, respiratory health outcomes with these groups. <clears throat> like you know, five ozone and all the usual bad guys that you know, that find these associations with. And that was good news for our stakeholders because that indicated to them that they're holding the product. So this is a, a good uh, uh, test of that. And there were a number of takeaways from these health analyses uh, that Kevin and Laura and the team uh, found. Uh, but I think for the purposes of this project, one of the most important is that uh, they found that you know it's really strong in the cities, and we can actually measure the change from space quite well. Uh, and some of the newer satellites are able to find So this was a uh, a bit of good news. And also, uh, after doing these health analyses, uh, which at first I grumbled about, but I, I, I've, come, I've come around and see that they have a lot of value for our project. Uh, because they're being used, the, the sense of the outcome of these health analyses for uh, some of the work that we're doing with the South African now. Um, so here are three of the main focus areas for these cities. First one is siting monitors. So they want about uh, uh, satellite data and air quality forecasts to be used to help them uh, site additional monitors. Uh, and they're also interested in having their air quality indices of value. Both cities have their own. And Kevin, this team is developing on that airport. And so we're going to do that. And the health analysis is going back on the basis for this. Uh, and then there's urban pollution monitoring. Of course, all the cities are interested in that. Uh, and there's an example of a trickle meeting today. Okay. So I grouped these two next sets of stakeholders because they have a lot more in common. Uh, they are both non government agencies. So these are. Uh, groups of people who are, are interested in influencing the government policy way to take action on the quality issues. The first is the African Center for Clean Air. In our context, there are Gabriel Kino, Helen, Sisi, uh, and they're out of Kampala, Uganda. But we have the potential after they are working with them to scale up and, and go out and meet the other CCA members and work with them in other African countries. Uh, and then in Bolivia, we have. Uh, we're working with two university folks. One of them actually was at NASA for a while, so he has a lot of expertise in satellite data. Um, and uh, that's um, uh, Marcos Andrade and Karen Crespo with Armando Rodriguez. He's from the nonprofit organization and they represent the cities of uh, La Paz, Santa Cruz, and Cochabamba, and Bolivia. And both of these groups have been very active and dynamic, enthusiastic to work with us. We've had a lot of handshake telecons and also um, uh, many trainings and awareness webinars uh, that they've been interested in to, to find out more about some resources. And both of these groups have little expertise in working with satellite data, uh, and they're, they're uh, well, I'll just tell them, they have little expertise in satellite data and their financial resources. 
typically very small. <clears throat> so, so where are we going with these two groups of stakeholders? So one that they're very interested in, uh, they're very interested in raising awareness of the impacts, the negative uh, health impacts of air pollution, uh, including to the government. And satellite data, they're well, perfect for this. Uh, they, they provide these comprehensive pretty pictures and everybody can understand them. <clears throat> they're also interested in, uh, when we were working with them, is uh, not just transparent boundary air pollution transport, uh, but even regional agricultural smoke. So agricultural fires are a seasonal event over much of the uh, LMIC. And in these two, Central Africa, Bolivia, uh, it, it's a major element to it for each season. And you can see, this is just one example of uh, AOB out of Bolivia. It's all of that, so it gives an indication of smoke thickness, the redder color so it means it's higher. Uh, and <clears throat> they're also interested, of course, in uh, And this is a tropical image from Kampala City in Uganda. And you can see the strong gradients in the blue, just in the picture. So I'll stop there. Uh, and we'll have to take any clarifying questions. Hi, uh, Aaron, Aaron Opsire, uh Montana DEQ, air quality meteorologist. This question is for Jeff Pierce. Uh, Jeff, did you put any kind of correction on the data from the purple air sensors? Yep. Because as you know, there's kind of a, a high bias during smoke events. Yeah, we use the first Caroline Bartron paper, um, which go, is good up, recommended up to 500 micrograms per meter cubed. Um, it's really critical, particularly the difference in relative humidity between South Florida in Kansas being, you know, the relative humidity corrections, like super important in addition to the straight up concentration dependent correction. We didn't have, fortunately, uh, the thick, thick smoke concentrations that require the new correction factor. But yeah, we do that. And we also test against any monitor, uh, any of our purple layers that are close enough to FRMs and FEM regulatory monitors to give additional information on when it might be failing, when those corrections might be failing. In the Thanks. Presentations, um, everyone. This is more of a general question. A lot of this research was kind of aimed at metropolitan areas or cities. And I often get questions from um, community organizations or community members from rural areas who kind of want to know what should they be doing? Because uh, even if you think of um, air now, it really relies on where those monitors are at. Uh, could we give any sort of um, answer to what we should be potentially telling them or looking into, especially considering the spatial resolution of satellites? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. And that that's what we were working, at least an initial step towards with, with these deployments of purple air monitors in regions that have very few regulatory or even purple air monitors. I think it will be useful for communities and local agencies to be deploying more low cost sensors in these regions to fill it in to help the satellites in these areas. Um, certainly for things like agricultural fires, it, there are times when there's like a field on fire and the concentrations are like hyper local, like kilometer scale differences. In that case, you need a very high concentration network, but even getting at some of the, you know, moving, moving some into communities where there aren't any is huge um, to help communities and local agencies make decisions on what they should do during times of higher pollution. I just want to jump in as um, our program is becoming more well known across our state. We've had people reaching out to us as well. Um, so right now we are just focused on the Milwaukee area, but we reached out to Purple Air and they're providing a discount to other school districts who might want to get this implemented sooner, might have the funds to do this. Um, so we're able to offer that discount. And then we're also trying to share resources sooner rather than later on ways they can implement this. The subject of climate is open to the public. So anybody, teacher from anywhere can log into the site to get lesson plans. Um, and so we're trying to 
support them along the way, even though we can't, we're not, our focus is not there yet, but we're trying to provide resources in the meantime. I think EP also does a loaner program. More people might know about that, but another opportunity if they need a sensor for a short time. If you looked at the nighttime behavior of smoke uh, at these different regions, one of the prescribed burning. That's a great question. We, we've examined it a lot in Kansas because the burning tends to be in the afternoon and the smoke continues to be produced into the early evening. And then, and then it's there. And then it just sort of moves gradually east overnight. And so a lot of times the concentrations peak on average around like 8 p.m. And so the, the ghost satellite's great because it can get it up to like towards when the sun sets, but it misses a lot of the, over, the overnight smoke that moves in that case towards Kansas City um, in that area and it doesn't capture that. So yeah, these things where the, the details matter in the, da in the daily cycle, it's still tricky for PM from satellites um, to, to get that out of it. Um, just to follow up from Shoba online, uh, she says, Jeff, great work. Um, have you been looking at trends in prescribed burns? Are they going to, are they going to keep PM 2.5 within the standards? Uh, thanks, Shoba. Um, we should do that. <laughs> we haven't yet. Um, and uh, the keeping within standards was a, a really good discussion on that within the wildfire group yesterday um, that I won't, I don't think I have anything I can add on beyond the great conversation. For these presentations, um, I was wondering, you know, even if we get these low cost sensors into areas like schools, um, there are uh, clinicians don't know what um, the recommendation should be, you know, um, kiddos should be out for five minutes or 10 minutes or 30 minutes um, based on what the AQI is. And so I'm wondering, how, how do you see it? Like, what is the future for research in that area? I mean, we can't do natural experiments, really. Um, I guess maybe, you know, portable monitors to the point where you're following people and then looking at asthma rates uh, or whatever, but that will be several years, I, I can imagine, down the line. Um, the other, I guess, option would be kind of extrapolating from mouse models, but I mean, you know, who knows if that's, you know, a good proxy. So I'm trying to understand where you think that research is going so that even if you get the sensors into the right place, um, how do you actually advise um, patients or schools? So right now it is, our focus is just information and awareness, knowing that there are these sensors, um, providing that just basic information. We're working with the city of Milwaukee Health Department um, to get some guidelines on what we can be suggesting or should be suggesting, um, just more basic. But we also are hearing that um, principals do not want the responsibility to be making these mandates to their schools that they want it to be coming from the district. Um, so that's further down the road. We're, again, this is, um, we are still installing our sensors right now. So we're working through a lot of this information. Um, but definitely we are looking to experts in the fields to be guiding our information that we're sharing out. So yeah, I, I'm, ex I'm interested to see where this goes as well. So thank you for that question. Question online for Brian, uh, about the health analysis in keto and Rio. Um, did you explore the influence of elevation considering that keto is about, um, 9,000 feet and Rio is on the coast? Yeah. Please pass the mic to Laura. Well, so if you're asking health analysis, uh, no. So the health analysis is based on. Am I not holding off? Um, for the health analysis, um, we were using their ground-based uh, networks in both cities. Um, those are in the city center. So it wouldn't have been also in Rio. We are on the coast. Um, and in Quito, it's in the valley uh, area of the mountains. Um, but that's why we're hoping to incorporate some satellite data and some future analyses. Um, though satellites do struggle with uh, coasts and mountainous areas, so there's some additional challenges that'll be going on there. Good morning, everyone. Um, this is for Sarah and then for Jeff. Um, Sarah, I heard you talk a little bit about your 
collaboration with the health department and the school district. Um, was it an easy sell to get them to come on board or did you have some challenges along the way? City of Milwaukee Health Department? Um, no, they were, they're very interested. They've actually been doing some of the indoor quality air work. And so they're looking to partner the outdoor because what's out comes in. So um, no, they are excited to be partnering with us actually. And um, for Jeff, because um, I was involved when they were trying to do the purple air monitors. One of the challenges that they did have was access to internet, particularly in rural areas. So just keep that in mind um, as you're looking at this. And then another suggestion, just it just dawned on, because people were asking me questions. If someone is diagnosed with asthma, you know, like how you have diabetes and you have your, your sensor to check without having to get sick, maybe you can do that as a prescription to give them a purple air monitor so they can monitor when the air is low or high. So that way that, that parent can make an informed decision on whether or not their child goes to school today or not. And that way you put the onus back into the, the individual because if you have to rely on the community sometimes in the industry to make do the right decision, it doesn't always happen. Uh, Jesse Marquez with the Coalition for a Safe Environment. We're a 22-year-old environmental justice organization headquartered in Wilmington, which is the community where the Port of LA is physically located. And we've been involved in air quality monitoring for like 20 years now. So, you know, we worked with the TSI P-Track, D-Track, Q-Track. We're part of the LA Purple Air Monitoring. Uh, there's a group, another group, Latino, called the IDA Collaborative, which uses the DILOS. And there's 50 plus communities that are using those. And you may not know, but under the California Air Resource Board, there are air quality management districts, like about 30 plus. In Los Angeles, it's the South Coast Air Quality Management District. And they have established about three years ago what is called the AQ Spec Lab. They have evaluated every, like 99% of what's out there on the PM low cost monitors. So if you're at the stage where you want to research which is the best one, the low cost one or whatever, they've done a study on every single one that's out there, unless it just came out last month. So that's a great resource to be able to compare different ones to see how they do. They are now starting a VOC. They've only have a handful at this point. Our organization got funded through a CARB, California Air Resources Board, AB 617 grant, and we're establishing the first where we've now jumped low cost VOC greenhouse gas and PM network. So in the next 90 days, those five air quality monitors will be up and running in Wilmington, which borders you know, the Port of Valley, Port of Long Beach, and we have four more refineries there. So now we're trailblazing as to what is that low cost? And that was a great challenge because also, as you well know, you can't find sensors that do everything. It takes a, a variety of different categories. And then we had spent two years and evaluated over 60 different types to try to find the right one. And it wasn't until recently, Centroid out of Canada came up with one that allows 11 different sensor configurations. And now we do have the ideal one of four greenhouse that we selected, three VOCs that we selected, and the PM with the weather station. So in a few months, that'll be all up and running and we share whatever we've learned from that with all of you. And that's why we're part of here. One of the team up now, with uh, Tempo and the Maya side, so we can now jump to the next level. But it's all community based. We have no scientists on our staff or board. We're all community scientists now learning and working our way up. But we do have a lot of different partners that we can work with that are help guide us. Hi, so kind of following his question, um, I think it was Jeff. Jeff, you showed us some satellite that had smoke and had a huge dust plume. Are there any? This, the next step that include VOC, that include the, the whole other sphere of, of inhaled pollutants that that are, you know, impacting people's health. Is there a, there's obviously not a low cost sensor, otherwise we wouldn't be focused on 2.5, but is there any research um, in you all's wheelhouse that includes um, the number of other environmental additives that come from burning, from dust, from, all of the sources that might be monitored uh, that are reserved for space. Uh, so you have nitrogen oxide, 
nitrogen dioxide on the head in my presentation and the seeds. Um, we have uh, the first integration of the solids and uh, other source gases. But we can measure this space so we can not have such a jersey problem. I ask one really quick. I mean, I don't know if it'll be quick. Heather Holmes, University of Utah. This is a question for Pawan. I really appreciated you showing the evaluation of your results on a like sub monthly scale, because when we look at things on a monthly or annual scale, they look great, right? So then you miss really acute air pollution events, especially in the Western United States. So wintertime temperature inversions, even the smoke events. Um, so my question for you is, can you speak from your experience? Like what, like, what do you think the best pathway forward is? Because things like MARA that assimilate satellite AOD, the coverage in the winter in the Western US of satellite AOD is almost 0%, right? So if you don't have AOD and you're assimilating that in, it's not really helping your model. So how do we, and then you have really sparse coverage of monitors, especially in states like Nevada and Utah. So. So what's the best path forward, in your opinion, for these models? Yeah, I think that's a great question. So there are certain limitations which comes with the job, right? So, for example, the snow covers in northern latitudes will definitely will be challenged. Uh, we don't have any very good capability currently from the satellite to actually detect aerosol when there is a snow on the ground. So no matter whether it's a geostationary satellite or polar orbit, we will have the same problem. So I don't know how to mitigate that problem, but that is a big challenge. Now, I think the moving forward is uh, when we combine multiple satellites, bring multiple data sources, bring in low-cost sensors, uh, uh, regulatory grade monitors, and then there are some really good models out there. So I think the future, I feel, is going to be a hybrid approach where you bring all these different data source, but then have a very strong, some kind of an ensemble approach where you actually bring this and bring their strength with them. It's not just dumped in a basket and then somebody can use whatever they want. They need to be properly planned. They need to be weighted based on their accuracies. And that final product should be... Uh, more useful to the users uh, on on more on a daily and sub daily scales where you are having specific uh, events. Uh, so there are definitely challenges, but I think we are moving in the right direction. That's all I can say. All right. Uh, let's give a round of applause to our speakers for their excellent presentations, and uh, thank you all for listening. This is our session. Please enjoy the rest of the meeting. <laughs>